Bonnie or Bay. Welcome to To the Contrary, a weekly discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. This week, women, minorities, and the Biden administration. Then, should Democrats give up on white women voters? With us today, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, Democrat from the District of Columbia, Linda Chavez, Chair of the Center for Equal Opportunity, Aaron Matson, co-founder of ReproAction, and Patrice Anwuka, Senior Policy Analyst at the Independent Women's Voice. Up first, is the cabinet diverse enough? This week, more than 1,000 influential black women put pressure on President-elect Joe Biden as he puts together his cabinet. They signed an open letter to Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris urging the transition team to appoint more black women. The letter referred to the fact that black women were key to their victory with 91% voting for the Biden-Harris ticket. So Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, how is Biden doing so far? Well, he's doing very well in getting a fairly diverse uh, group around him. Many of us who are African-American women believe he should be doing better on that score, however. Better? How? Better. Much better. Uh, because black women uh, overwhelmingly vote for the Democratic ticket, and he benefited from that overwhelmingly as well. Right. But what other appointments should be going to black women, do you think? Well, black women uh, uh, may have gotten the hot appointment if the if as we hear Marsha Fudd, one of Fudge, one of my colleagues, will be appointed, it's that it's there where we are looking. We're looking for cabinet appointments. He's made a lot of appointments of African Americans and women, but the place to go now is to the very top. Well, what, so what about the fact that he made an African American? He made some history with uh, an African American male. Uh, as apparently as secretary, his nominee for secretary of defense. And doesn't that take, I mean, I hate to put it this way, but having put an African-American man and made history that way, does that lessen his obligation to black women? Well, I applaud him for that. It's very unlikely that a black woman would have been appointed secretary of defense. Uh, but to have a black man appointed to that issue uh, for, is a big boom for black Americans. Uh, that doesn't erase his debt to African-American women, the highest voting block for him and for Democrats. Linda Chavez, your thoughts? Well, first of all, he did also appoint to his cabinet a, an African-American woman to be ambassador to the United Nations. That's a very high profile course. But as you might expect, um, Bonnie, I'm not much into counting by race. Um, it's not something that I think um, is uh, is useful. And in fact, I think it's actually backfired. Javier Becerra, who I think um, is in fact a very well qualified uh, appointee to head up HHS, a lot of the criticism that's coming uh, among conservatives and even from the Wall Street Journal uh, is treating him like he is uh, a token Latino in the administration. Of course, the DHS uh, secretary is also Latino. But I think that, you know, when we start thinking of these posts just in terms of the color of the skin of who is appointed, uh, we do some disservice. I think uh, I'm, I'm generally happy that Joe Biden has picked a very centrist slate of uh, nominees. And Patrice Lee, allow me to ask you before I go to Aaron, when he is so public about saying that he is going to make a very diverse cabinet, which is, of course, what his base has uh, voted for him for in many ways, but does he turn off the 74 million Americans who voted for Trump and who must have liked something about the fact that he had a, an historically for this era a uh, vast majority of white males in his cabinet. Well, I don't think many Trump supporters uh, were just looking at the racial and gender makeup of the cabinet, both of the Trump cabinet uh, as well as now the potential Biden cabinet. I think they're thinking more about the policies and how far left or centrist um, some of these nominees are. 
you know, I think what's interesting, Joe Biden is in a minefield when it comes to race and, and gender and these diversity quotas that have been, in essence, created for him. Um, now you have a case where if he if you have a qualified white male, even one who uh, is part of the LGBTQ community like Pete Buttigieg, um, he's not going to be considered for certain cabinet appointments because it's assumed that those should go to, you know, a black woman or a Hispanic uh, man. And I think that's, I, I agree with Linda, that's the challenge of when you're putting race and gender or diversity uh, ahead of um, meritocracy and whether someone is really right for the role. But Trump supporters, I think they're more concerned about what uh, these cabinet nominees would want to do uh, when it comes to domestic policy and foreign policy. And there's plenty to be worried about. Does anybody really think any more about women or people of color as lacking the credentials. I mean, this is not 1960. We're talking about 2020, when so many people of color have been in high positions all over corporate America and um, and certainly the federal government. I mean, Bracera, for example, former member of Congress for 12 years, and uh, you know, Attorney General of the state of California, largest state in the country. You can't. Can I mean, can anybody make the argument that are, that there aren't these people were picked only because of skin color or race? No, I don't think they're making that argument, Bonnie. I think people will criticize and say, well, wait a minute. Uh, yeah, you have ca qualified candidates, but why is it that that this person is better for a role that maybe they don't have the experience in, but they, you know, but but you're putting someone else in. I think uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg uh, is a really great example of how this is backfiring, as Linda um, mentioned. So, you know, I I, 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 I I don't think anyone is saying that you that he's necessarily putting forward, forward people who are not qualified, but I do think I think the idea of tokenism is there, and I do think the idea of not uh, of of just uh, putting people forward based on their gender and their race is something that I think we've moved forward as as a country from. Erin, oh, your thoughts? Well, Bonnie, I've been reading in the Wall Street Journal, which is a conservative publication, all week about Nasdaq uh, creating quotas and starting to put pressure on companies to up women on their boards of directors. I think the Democratic base and I think the American people can handle a cabinet that looks more like America. I echo the delegate in um, saying that you know Biden has a debt to repay, particularly to black women who turned out for him in record numbers. And I would really like to see him lean further into his cabinet as he did on the night of his acceptance speech and victory speech, where he had Vice President-elect Harris go out first in white with a much more robust speech. That was an electrifying model of white male allyship, and it's time for him to step up in and do some more on the cabinet. Right, but that wasn't my question. My question is, does it, he's also trying to unite the country. Does it not, does it, do you believe, alienate further the, uh, the largely white uh, 74 million voters who, who voted for uh, Trump. You know, Bonnie, I don't believe that's the case. I think that we have to put people in place who rec reflect America. And I don't think that the answer to concern about bigotry within the white community is the response to that is to just put more white people on the cabinet. I think we've got to move forward as a country. It's 2020. We've been through a bruising four years of white supremacy, white supremacists marching through America. It's time for something new. Bonnie, I would uh, just, can I just say, Bonnie, I, I worry about categorizing or, or, or mm -hmm. um, characterizing, sorry, um, uh, opposition to what the Biden administration is going to do from white people as bigotry. Um, and I think that's a disservice that's done to Trump supporters all the time. Uh, a la, in, in, the, in the words of um, Hillary Clinton, they're a basket full of deplorables, xenophobic, xenophobic racist, misogynistic, et cetera. And I think that is kind of the um, uh, what, what a lot of Trump supporters and conservatives have felt they've been looked down upon for thinking, oh, it's not so much that the race or the gender, it's the policies that they worry about, cultural policies as well as economic and, 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 and every other type of policy. And so let's be careful about calling all white Trump supporters big. I I, I'm not sure I called them bigots. I said that they, what I do believe is that some of them are, I mean, even President Trump said there are good people on both sides <laughs> of of the the riot in Charlottesville. I'm not making up. I'm not the first one to say that 
that some of these people at least may be, may be bigoted. I mean, come on. So, uh, and we saw instances of that. So, uh, but, but my question is, will they be turned off to Biden, who has promised to unite the country, if he does this? And it's not just that he's making these appointments, he's stating, I mean, he stated before he selected her that he would pick a female vice presidential candidate. He stated that he will appoint the most diverse cabinet in American history, even though he worked for the president who did appoint the most diverse cabinet so far in American history. These are not issues he's avoiding. If I could just say, Bonnie, that one of the, I think you're absolutely right that uh, what uh, President-elect Biden needs to do once he takes office and becomes president uh, is to unite the country. And it's unfortunate, uh, given the Trump followers who uh, are being led to believe, not just by the president, but by people with L, uh, within the party, that the, somehow the election was stolen, something that I think is a disgraceful, anti-democratic rhetoric. Uh, but I do think that it's important for him to reach across the aisle. I frankly think he would be well advised to appoint a Republican to his uh, cabinet. This is something that other presidents have done, appointed someone from the opposite party. And I think that would be um, an important signal to try to bring the country together. Uh, I, I think the de Democrats often do that. And I expect that's right. I expect that to happen. But I do want to say this. I give Trump supporters more credit than believing that they are turned off by the diversity of Biden's cabinet. I really don't think they that's where they would have an issue with Biden. Their issue will be with these people carrying out Biden's policies. So I don't think we should... should 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 hop on Trump supporters, because I haven't heard them speak out against this diversity. Uh, I think we have to wait until they speak out against specific cabinet members. And there, I think, they will focus in on where, the, where they are on policies, as with the new Secretary of Defense. What uh, other posts are you looking to see uh, President-elect Biden appoint well, uh, not a lot of, color, uh, particularly I, I, black see, women, too. Yeah, there are a lot of cabinet posts uh, to, be, uh, to, to be filled. I, I had a list of cabinet posts, and they, they really is a long list here. Um, the, if you look at we, we've got HUD. Uh, there is a Congress who wants to be... Um, head of the Department of Education. Uh, there's the Commerce Department. That's a an area where I haven't seen African-American women. There's the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, we've got HUD, but you see there are a lot of cabinet, uh, cabinet uh, posts. I was trying to think of some others. Don't have an attorney general yet. Uh, wouldn't that be terrific to go to an African-American woman? And there are lots of African-American women who have gone to law school and have attained important posts. Yourself and included, we might add. You say what? <laughs> Yourself included, <laughs> you might add. And of course, there's a part, I don't think he's named anybody for the Department of Transportation, uh, which is another cabinet post. So I think he's got plenty of picks left uh, if we're talking cabinet picks. I, I'm not so focused on the gender or the race. Um, I do think there are some important uh, jobs to fill. I mean, interior is another one. Um, as a Westerner, as somebody who hails from the Western part of the United States, that's an important uh, job. Uh, and Michelle uh, Lujan Grisham, uh, governor of New Mexico was mentioned uh, she apparently was not interested in that, but uh, there are lots of jobs left to be filled. I hope they're filled with the best people possible, and that includes women, 
and that includes uh, blacks and Hispanics, but it also in includes some white men. And I'd like to see uh, at least uh, one Republican appointed to this cabinet. I don't think, particularly when he's put so much emphasis on trying to unify the country, I don't think it's out of the picture to consider that he might choose a Republican. I will say, however, that he will run into a lot of problems with his base uh, if he chooses someone, particularly someone who um, is extremely conservative and harsh on what are called social issues, but it's actually mm -hmm. talking about justice, particularly someone who's anti-abortion. I think he would have hell to pay if he went that route. Your thoughts, Patrice. Do you think there's any um, Republican sitting senator who might accept the job of, for example, Commerce Secretary, where there aren't so many social issues that come up? No, because from a policy standpoint, uh, if conservatives really do support uh, at least keeping the 2017-2018 the tax cuts intact, um, if they really have uh, abided by, would want to abide by or, or stop uh, Biden's um, plans, economic plans, then there's no way that they would take it a post to, to frankly promote that. Okay, we're gonna turn now to a slightly different topic, which is um, I interviewed uh, journalist Liz Lentz, who wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post uh, the last couple of weeks, saying that Democrats should basically give up on white women. Here's what she said. You said that uh, Democrats should pretty much drop the idea of going after white women voters because they haven't won that category of voters in decades. And you don't seem to think they ever will. Tell me about that. And I think we need to be more critical in our understanding of politics and our understanding of people. And that, you know, we, we understand that white women, especially white women of power, and upper middle class white women are not identifying with their gender when they go into the voting booth. They're identifying with power, with money, and race. And uh, and and I do think that, you know, it, our parties, a Democrats party's efforts are better suited to looking at who forms the basis of this party, who's really the most reliable Democratic voter. Okay, so how do you if the Democrats were to say, drop white women as a target demographic, how would that work? And and let me also say that you talk, it is correct that white women, if you don't divide them, uh, white married women uh, have voted Republican for the last, uh, God knows, back to Reagan almost, um, presidential mm -hmm. elections in 40 years ago. But white single women who are, by definition, less wealthy as a group, um, vote with minor with women of color. And it really seems to have to more to do to me as someone who's followed this issue for 40 years or more um, to do with economics uh, than it does than it's more frequently pointed out in the media. Once again, the issue is not why we should pander to white women. The issue should be who is the actual base of this party and what and who should we be serving? You know, we, we should stop trying to appeal to this demographic if we're never going to win them over and we should look at who we should be appealing to. We should be talking about health care, right? We should be talking about child care. We should be talking about the minimum wage. And instead of this kind of like middle of the road centrism, that famous Texas columnist, you know, said uh, the only thing that belongs in the middle of the road are our, our lines and roadkill and look at the basis of our party stop trying to win over lost causes and really start getting fired up about how we can enact change in frankly a broken country do you agree that this is a demographic white women or more specifically and we'll get into that in a second white married women are a group that the democrats should give up on i don't think the democrats should give up on anybody so i want to be clear about that and uh first and foremost. But we saw, I want to add some nuance to this picture because what we saw was with Biden, 
um, we actually had white college educated women in the suburbs went for him in a greater percentages. There were some gain in points versus Hillary Clinton. And I think it's important to add to and continue that momentum. Um, and also, for that matter, I'm really sick and tired of this idea of giving up on the white working class and undereducated voters, as Trump called them. And he would say, I love undereducated voters and like kind of that's not the way less it is. I think he said less educated voters, but same idea. Poorly educated. Whatever he said, it was a horrible statement to make. And I think the fact is that we need to embrace everyone in our tent and, and reach out to them with a comprehensive message of equality and justice and liberation for all people. The fact of the matter is giving up on white women is a bad idea. Democrats have some momentum, particularly with college educated women. They got to build on it. All right. Your thoughts, Linda? Well, I, I absolutely. Uh, again, I don't like appeals that are just based on race. I don't think that uh, that's what matters. Uh, and I do think there are other uh, things about <laughs> these voters that are, are more important. And I think focusing on uh, white voters, um, you know, th there were a lot of lower middle class whites who voted for Barack Obama. Um, and the idea that you're never going to see working class whites vote uh, for a Democrat uh, when they voted for one of the more liberal Democrats that we've elected in recent memory. So I, I really think that would be a mistake. And, and with respect to women, yes, there are divisions. Um, what has been interesting to me is looking at the minority vote and looking at the fact that uh, President Trump did better with black men uh, than he did last time around, in fact, than most Republicans do. Uh, and he did uh, much better with Hispanic men, uh, not as well as uh, President uh, Reagan or George W. Bush, but he still got close to 30% of the Hispanic vote. And in some areas, he won a majority uh, of the uh, vote in certain counties uh, in certain precincts in Florida and in South Texas. So that to me is in some way more interesting. Congresswoman, your thoughts? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked by that really, when you consider how, mm -hmm. how his policies have been uh, on their face offensive uh, against these groups. Um, uh, but I, I think women uh, are, are probably the country's most thoughtful voters white women and African-American women. And this notion that white women voted overwhelmingly for Trump has been shown to be false. It turns out that 47 percent, not 53 percent, voted for Trump. So I don't think we should stereotype white women any more than we stereotype African-American women. I would also like to make a further um, subdivision of this demographic group, and then I'll, I'll ask you to weigh in, please, Patrice, but actually white married women since Reagan, and of course, when you're married, you're ha you have a bigger household income on average than when you're a single mother, but white married women have gone for the Republican for president since uh, Reagan in 1980, but white single women and single mothers who are, of course, more, to me, it's more of an economic difference than it is a racial difference because it's lower income women generally who will vote Democratic part for the Democrats. And the reason for that is logical. They are more reliant on the, on the benefits that Democrats support for them. Um, yeah, I agree with you there, Bonnie. I mean, I think when we look at married women um, and uh, they're thinking about family um, and they're thinking whether they want greater government intervention, greater government control or less, in which case, you know, policies like tax cuts um, that benefit middle class families are going to be important to them. Um, deregulation, um, you know, small business policies that, that spur small business growth to the point where, you know, women were starting 1800 jobs every day. Um, from 2017 and 2018 speaks to that. So I think I, I think when you think about uh, white women, um, white married women, um, you know, it, it's not surprising that they still tend to lean more conservative. And I and I hope we do get away from this rhetoric. Uh, and I see a lot from my my black female friends 
who are like, what white women need to sit down and, and be silenced and take a back seat. I think we should be treating, we should be listening to each other, understanding each other's situations and the, the political calculations people make when they, they go to vote, not just um, uh, you know, uh, uh, thinking, well, uh, because you vote, you supported Trump, you're some sort, you're, there, there's something wrong with you, or calling you a name, or even looking down on you in a way that, you know, that, that, that shouldn't be the case. I think this elitism, unfortunately, we see quite often on the left is probably what drove a lot of uh, conservative women or even independent women to vote for Trump, but to say in the polls or to say to their friends, no, I'm a Biden supporter. All right, thank you all so much. Great discussion. That's it for this edition. Please follow us on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Please visit our PBS website, which is tothecontrary.org. And whether you agree or think, to the contrary, see you next time. Funding for To the Contrary provided by the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation the Colcom Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. For a transcript or to see an online version of this episode of To the Contrary, please visit our PBS website at pbs.org forward slash to the contrary. Be more PBS.